Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The state of organized labor interests me greatly, and I can't think of a better person to talk about it than Ed Ott, the executive director of the New York City Central Labor Council and an outstanding advocate for working men and women. I think I've always called it the Joint Council. Why is that? Is that wrong? No, uh, probably because you were familiar with some of the older, like garment trade had a joint council. I Teamsters was, have a joint yeah. council. There are, there are a lot of joint councils. So what is it? The Central Labor Council <laughs> is an organization of 400 local unions and other organizations. Uh, and it is designed as an official arm of the AFL-CIO. It's designed to be the public face of the labor movement in New York City. And the unions stretch. I mean, there are all kinds of unions. Public there, sector, public sector, private sector, building trades, right. hospital workers, nonprofits. Right. Uh, we pretty much run the gamut. Is there any manufacturing union left in the city? There's small numbers of manufacturing unions, like the electrical workers. Uh, well, they're, most people think of them as solely a construction yeah. union. Have about right. eleven thousand manufacturers, but okay. we've lost over a million manufacturing jobs in this city, uh, really since the seventies, early eighties. So, so the main is it is it the main source of employment then becomes, what public sector. And service well, employees? Well, actually, I mean, the city's economy is fairly diverse. Retail is a huge employer in the right. city. Uh, we have a large nonprofit sector in, in hospitals and research, et cetera. Uh, and government is uh, a big employer. Wall Street is um, under a different type, very important economic engine, and feeds a lot of service industries, uh, particularly in Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn. So uh, the city's economy is fairly diverse right now. But the loss of manufacturing jobs really changed both the character of the labor unions in the city and I, and I believe the uh, political climate of the city. So have the wages, the average wages of union members increased in the same proportion that the economy has improved? It depends on the sector. It does. Uh, and certainly in the public sector, nonprofit sector. I mean, when I came in the labor movement, hospital workers, some of them were still making $48 a week right. uh, for very long hours. Uh, they are now at a lower middle class, a middle class standard. Uh, but in the retail sector, we have, and the service sector, we have a lot of new Americans, mm -hmm. immigrants. Uh, wages can be very low. I mean, I marvel at how mm -hmm. people making six seventy-five an hour, seven twenty-five, when they get paid, figure out ways to live in the city. Yeah, where do they live? They live all over. I mean, Queens, Brooklyn. They're in the boroughs and the Bronx. But uh, immigrants have very complicated lives and extended families, and they find ways through this city that I've forgotten how to live on eight dollars an hour. It's incredible. How do you define the members of the different unions? Are they middle class? Are some of them not middle class? How do you well, I, it really depends on who you're talking to. I describe uh, the, the city right now in terms of its workforce is that there's really almost two working classes. There's one that's organized in unions. They have a modicum of security. Uh, they have the expectation that they can live a little better than they did before. Many have the expectation of being able to even move out of the city, buy a home, mm -hmm. or buy a home in the city, although that's getting harder to do. Uh, and then there's this other working class that you see on the subways at 6.30 in the morning. You might see them again at 11.30 at night, 10 o'clock at night. They work long hours. Uh, they work in the service sector. They work anywhere from minimum wage to $12 an hour. And uh, it is amazing to me that they survive in this city, but they are the backbone of the working class. The mayor talks about it openly, that we need more people. Uh, and we do. We expect more people to be coming to this city over the next 20 years. Where are we going to put them? We don't have the schools. We don't have the houses. Um, we don't have the capacity. It's so that's bad. That's the big problem. Housing, right? to me, housing is <laughs> such a, an important <laughs> issue. It's so bad that our political operation, if there's a close election in eastern Pennsylvania, we are asked to call New York City workers, unionized workers who live in Pennsylvania and commute to the city for work. There's that many people, that and something? that's all being driven by the cost of yeah, housing. Yeah. Are, do you, do you, do the unions here, uh, are they complementary to the union, the state of labor outside of New York? Well, you know, it's funny. If you take New York, Chicago, uh, L.A., uh, it, it pretty much feels yeah. like on a surface that it's the old unions of many, many years right. ago. But the truth is uh, that the service unions in particular have a very different experience than service unions did 30, 40 years ago in this city. The largely immigrants, 
they're getting that first rung, like a union like 32 BJ, the service employees, these people work in building services uh, in different capacities in commercial and high rent buildings. Um, that's still a blue collar ladder. Mm. These are folks who can come here, hotels the same way. Come here, they start at low wages, but eventually they move through the system. They have an expectation that they will have a middle class lifestyle. And then they move to Pennsylvania. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, if they can. I mean, if. Yeah. I mean, it's an odd thing right now. If you own anything anywhere, you're frozen in place because even if you sell, what are you going to buy? Right. Uh, and then if you haven't bought, it's tough. And that's good. That, that holds for everybody, you, me, everybody. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> it, it's odd. Do you know, when I grew up, you, everybody knew the names of the leading labor leaders in the country and in, in the city, right? Yes. Walter Ruther, John Lewis, all, I mean, all these people. And in the city, it was, you know, city, well, I mean, we had Mike Quill, we, who was a regular, Al Shanker, who was remembered after 68, not always right. fondly, and cab drivers would let him know right. on the street. But uh, they certainly and were amalgam, controversial figures. Yeah. Right. So why don't we have that kind of thing now? Well, I, I think you do in a certain way, and people don't seem to realize. I, if you ever spend a morning with Roger Toussaint and walk into a diner, right. that, uh, yeah. the working class knows Roger Toussaint. Right. Well, uh, I think we all know Roger Toussaint and, because of a strike. And Randy Weingarten, everybody yeah. knows. Um, but l labor leaders in general are not... Uh, always uh, press friendly in the sense that they 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 don't seek that limelight in the same way. So our culture has always been. It was always a few labor leaders you knew. You had a guy in New York, Harry Van Osdale, who was known by virtue of his deeds, right. but not because he ever wanted to sit down and give an interview to the right. New York Times. Right. He wasn't interested, <laughs> uh, but people knew him. So it was a little different. But also at, at a certain point, you know, if you want to go back, John L. Lewis and those guys, they were part of a national change that was going okay. from an unorganized working class to an organized working class that presidents wanted to be in the room with. And they were recognizable national figures. But you pay a lot of attention to politics, and unions do pay a lot, even more attention right. in a way. You're raising, you raise much money and send many workers, right? Right. But why aren't you more, why, not you, because I exclude you from all of it, but why, why don't we see, are unions uh, union-centric? I mean, are unions, well, interested that's more. a fair question, and I think people have to understand unions are, in many ways, member-centric. Mm -hmm. They are their first obligation to, of a union leader is to defend what their members have, and that does two things to us. It closes us off a little bit from some of the broader social movements, mm -hmm. but it also, uh, in, in many many ways, it, it it makes us resist transition to the new. Uh, it, it's almost a working class instinct that if there's going to be changes, it's going to be done at our expense. Mm -hmm. And people expect their unions to insulate them from disruptive changes. So labor unions in general do not transition to the new well. And you get into one of these periods where the whole world changes. Cold War ends. The world economy is reorganized. Mm -hmm. Globalization takes place. Manufacturing is sucked out of the country, first to Mexico, now to Asia and China. Uh, those kinds of changes are very disruptive. It tends to make labor leaders uh, cautious about change and, and working people cautious about change because they feel like it's being done at their expense. But it's interesting because I, I think part of the part of part of the problem with our the way we run, the way we uh, develop a community opinion. Um, and and the way we enter into politics is different the way it used to be. I mean, it's now special interest groups. It's the um, it's the what they call the minority caucus, which is so ridiculous. But it's going to be Latinos. It's going to be African Americans. It's going to be women, environmentalists, AIDS people. It's all separate advocates advocating for themselves and sometimes against each well, other. In some ways, in, in some ways, the but workplace is the last together? truly integrated institution. Yeah, right. So labor unions, uh, oddly enough, I think we have a bit of an edge on that and that we feel an obligation to try to figure out how to right. represent everybody, uh, even when we're confined in our individual unions. So, so in some ways, we're better prepared for what's coming next. But we're definitely in a transition period. Uh, organized labor was really slam dunked after the Cold War. We had a certain expectation, I believe, that a social contract mm -hmm. that existed since World you were War II would very be continued. Well, right. Right. When that didn't happen, we were unprepared for the changes. So we're in a period of adjustment, which I, I would point out is very consistent with our history. If you backed up a hundred and some odd years, uh, capital in this country was organized on a national level and monopoly mm -hmm. forms. Mm -hmm. We were intermittent and local. Uh, we've always tailed behind developments in capitalism. We tend to be a reactive movement in that sense. Mm -hmm. But there come crucial moments. 
uh, you, when the civil rights movements emerge, is certain unions have to make real choices. Right. So y when you can't make progress, you make different choices. Right. And I think that's what's happening now is you're seeing new leadership emerging and new forms emerging. So we're going to have to, uh, I think we'll be do doing better as we go forward. Well, you know, we've been actually growing in New York City. The uh, union. Oddly enough. The joint, ca the can you know, we, I mean, we, Well, not just not the, the council. In terms council. of council. Raw numbers of members who've joined. Uh -huh. We are up about 85,000 in the last five years or so. It was in Cranes a Where couple of weeks ago. From? Well, some of it is organizing in, in, in public sector, and mm -hmm. some of it is unions like 32BJ mm -hmm. in the service sector starting to get traction in securities industry. Well, does that places. follow also the development of real estate development? Well, more office buildings, more residential buildings. You don't follow, buildings, you don't follow right. real estate development in this town. You're unemployed. Right. I mean, it's Absolutely. Just, they, yeah. they, they run the town. So, what about the war that in Iraq? That interests me. I mean, here we are. We have an economy. We're spending billions of dollars in Iraq. We have. We're back. It seems to be to the Eisenhower military-industrial complex, which during the Second World War the, the unions did very well. Well, I, I got to tell you, um, they did well because. All of the manufacturing to fight that war was done in this country, yeah, and, and, and now we contract behind. out for everything. Right. But you also, I mean, you have to also, in, just in terms of an impact on a base, uh, as as a social issue, yeah. uh, the lessons that were learned after the Vietnam. Vietnam War, you you also have a, a very a professional army, mm -hmm. a decentralized mm -hmm. structure. It's a uh, whole different story. Out. So it's a whole different story. So you don't get the mass resistance to the war that you get. You know, Lyndon Johnson doesn't mobilize the reserves in the National Guard because he knew his Civil War history. Mm -hmm. And he was worried that w these units of working class, middle class places in, in the South in particular, we get caught in one of these battles and everybody get wiped out and there'd be this tremendous opposition. So he ups the draft, the middle class revolts, and it begins to change the rules of the game. They go back to a professional army. So we should follow Wrangell. Well, I, you know, look, from, <laughs> well, we from the point of view of a democracy, yeah. if you're going to fight a war, uh, the entire population should be involved in it somehow. This president decided to go to war with a professional army, understaffed, uh, underweaponized, frankly, for the things they were being asked to do. And at the same time, he has not involved anybody else in this country to feel the pain of this war. Mm -hmm. They've tried to insulate people from mm -hmm. it. They, actually, they can probably keep this war going for a mm -hmm. long time. And the interesting thing is a lot of the people who are the army and who are forming it or in the guards are people who need the money, Absolutely. and it's either to finish their education or instead of a job. It's a job. For it, them. it is a second job for a lot yeah. of people, or it's an it's opportunity to get some scholarship right. money. Uh, it, it's that very, certainly very complicated. speaks to a social ill. Another one. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. But you know, wages in this country are beginning to, from the very top. The wealthy are doing much better. The gaps are getting much wider. I believe it's social dynamite going down the road if we don't strengthen the organizations like unions that mitigate those impacts. And we have to figure that out. Is that being discussed a lot within? It's certainly being discussed at, on uh, the national levels of the labor movement, both in the AFL-CIO and the Change to Win Federation. You know, everybody's trying to get a handle on a couple of things. How do we come to terms with health care and what's the best way to do it? How do you close this gap on wages? Um, we believe, and we uh, historically speaking, we believe we're the most effective anti-poverty organization. But if you keep reducing workers' rights, which is every that? poll says 60 percent of people say they want a union, but they never ask the second question: Are you willing to risk your livelihood in order to get it? And the answer there is probably not. And that's what's going on. Employers fire with employees. So, and the, the and the more we have people that are on contract and not permanent employees, right? Exactly. And, and well, actually, the governor of this state just took a big step. He signed into law uh, a misclassification order, which is designed to go after these employers who cheat the unemployment system, the workers' comp system, don't provide health care, by claiming someone's a contract employee yeah. when, in fact, they are a real worker. Right. And just so they don't have to pay any of the fringe or give them any rights. And has there developed a profession of consultants to corporations on how not to have unions? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's, so, it's really it, sick, isn't it? It's a subculture so of, if, the, of the lawyer's industry. It follows. I mean, I, I'm not a sociologist, and I wish I was. But we feel that it's that we have a culture now that's very much more in, individual-oriented, it seems to me. It's not a common good anymore. 
on the part of lots of people, not unions. Right. I'm not saying the unions right. are the counterbalance uh, of it. Uh, look, yeah. So the corporations are now operating on the bottom line, the profit of the bottom line, right? They're operating solely on, a, on yeah. the bottom line. I mean, one of the things that's interesting in New York City, y you don't have even some of the old families that felt like they had a civic responsibility yeah. here. Uh, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out as things go forward. Uh, it can't only be about the money. It, you can't organize a society that way and keep it uh, calm. Uh, it, I believe it's very dangerous it's to, to have off, this right? indifference. I don't. I mean, I don't know what form it's going to take. But, but look, the, the, there's a difference between having an economy and having an economy in a democracy. And they did not accomplish this kind of economy without reducing democratic rights. And people were indifferent to the fact that a lot of that was going after yeah. labor rights and worker rights. Right. And the poor take it in the neck, and nobody sees it. It's really, I was astonished in January when they released a figure showing that the bonuses on Wall Street were like $45 billion. It was almost equal to the budget of the city of New right, York. Right. And that, how can you sustain an economy that way? You can't. Well, you can't. I mean, you uh, can't uh, with justice, economic with, justice. With, There's with no any, economic justice. any kind justice. of justice. Right. Although it's odd, right? Yeah. Last year we were outraged that $45 billion worth when one of the companies has taken $3 billion in public subsidies. Yeah. And now this year we're talking about, gee, if Wall, Th Wall Street goes south, there'll be no bonuses, it's bad for the economy. <laughs> so it's like we're damned if we do, right. damned if we don't, we can't win. Right. Uh, the truth of the matter is they're counting on some of that money to keep the real estate industry yeah. going. They're the ones that are buying the apartments and the high-rises and everything That's else true. in Manhattan. That's true, it is. And if the bottom falls out of that, we're going to get a dip in the housing, high-end yeah. housing market. Then you lose the jobs. People, people are going to be out of work. So what do you, um, how do you feel about, let's talk about some of the techniques that are being used with unions, the card check. Right. That, uh, the first time I heard about card check with the restaurant workers at Lincoln Center with... Um, the Hotel 100. Yes. Yes. Um, and people don't understand the card check, so let's just describe it a little bit. Well, first let me just describe the system you have okay. now. Right now you, could, you, you sign a card. It's called an authorization card. This is for an NLRB election, National Labor mm -hmm. Relations Board. That card says, I want this union to represent me for wages, hours, mm -hmm. and working conditions. If you have a majority of those cards, you can present them to the employer through the National Labor Relations mm -hmm. Board. The employer has a choice at that point. On face value, have the board check the validity of the cards and say, you have a majority, I'll negotiate, or I can insist on an election. What's happened is you have elections like they had elections in Haiti. If the workplace was in Haiti, Jimmy Carter and international monitors would be dragged in over the outrages that are committed against workers. So the labor movement and some of our allies have come to the conclusion that we need a new system. And what we want to do is have a card check and neutrality, mm. where this is a discussion among working people. If the majority of them sign up, that is taken to a board, it is adjudicated as valid, and the employer is ordered to begin negotiations. There are appeals in that, et cetera, but there would be protections. But we have come to the conclusion that it, the NLRB election system has become so coercive that workers cannot utilize it in order to exercise their fundamental rights. So is there national legislation pending? There is uh, Employee Free Choice Act. Uh, it has been voted on in the Congress and in the Senate. Uh, we don't expect this president will sign it, but we have great hopes that the next one will. Mm. And we're working very hard to, to see that happen. What, what is the, uh, what do general, labor unions generally feel about uh, the increasing immigrant population and um, undocumented workers? Well, it, goes, it really goes through different periods. You know, five, six years ago, uh, there was a lot more uh, open support for the rights of immigrants and concerns about the standards that they were facing. Mm -hmm. There's been such a, a, a wave, particularly uh, in cities like New York and Chicago, L.A., that there's now some fear of immigrants mm -hmm. developing. Uh, but here's what's happened, and, and I, I think we have to come to terms with it. The way I always say it is, it's the exploitation of the immigrants that threatens our standards, not the immigrants. Mm -hmm. There's a huge underground economy in this city. There are employers who hire immigrants knowing they have no legal papers, therefore they have no rights. They pay them cash. They don't put anything into unemployment for them. They don't put anything into pensions or health care or anything yeah. else. And that does, in the, in the end, begin to feel right. to people like that's a threat to us. Yeah. The question is at that point, who do you blame? Mm -hmm. I don't like the term illegals. When you had, after the 86 Immigration Act, we basically decided on bad public policy to allow millions of people into this country. The government wanted them. The employers wanted them. 
to turn around now and say you are here illegally flies in the face of, of real reality. My view of it is we have to come up with a rational system to determine how much labor we need in a given period each year. Um, we have a right to control our borders and the amount of labor that comes in. But once people are here, it has to be one standard for everybody. If you're on a job, you should be entitled to mm -hmm. all the rights and benefits of everybody else so that you are not seen as a part of the problem. But that again goes to employers aggressively seeking only the bottom line, no social responsibility, and a tremendous indifference to their impact on the real lives of the middle class. And it also, it, it, it's the other side of NAFTA, and when people are now talking about changing NAFTA and reforming it, which you know is like pie in the sky, it seems to me it's very difficult. But if they paid decent wages in Mexico, then many people wouldn't be leaving. Right? It's true. Although I, I have to say something here, and, and I, I've been saying this to a lot of different audiences, and I'll, I'll say it here, even though it's a little bit controversial. The truth of the matter is, in this country, we tend to look at ourselves as victims of immigration. If you talk to the Europeans who have some of the same problems, they talk about migration and that in fact this is the new economy. Okay. Vietnamese go to China, the China go, Chinese go everywhere, the Russians go to Western Europe and to the United States, and the whole South, uh, South America is coming north. Right. What are they doing? They're looking for a better life. Mm -hmm. But we better get used to it. That is the new global economy. Mm -hmm. When I was talking before about all the rules changed, that's what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. There is a global economy. It is very complicated. We better figure it out or they will grind us down to poverty. And all they care about is how much money they make. And yeah. That's where we're at. But we also have to have it, well, right, it's interrelated into foreign policy and the administration and what we're doing, right? They, Instead of spending the billions of dollars that we're doing to kill and destroy, we should be spending it Somebody to rewrote assist. all the rules of the game. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's very little civic structure over the flow of capital. They go anywhere they want, right. do what they want. No government can stand up to them. Uh, and we're the one government that probably could and we have chosen not to. Right. And, and look at China. I mean, we've just now, there are two American-based companies. Is there two Chinese companies that are incorporated here and they're now on the stock exchange yes. today? Yes. And then how, what's, what do you think, isn't there going to be some kind of effect from the, the toy business and the lead paint? I mean, w is there a chance that it would inspire more manufacturing in this country? Well, it, I think you may see a spot market. Uh, there's a big demand for American-made toys right now, and people, I think, are looking towards Christmas time. And you know, usually all your manufacturing is done by now, and yeah. they're getting ready to ship. Because yeah. if your stuff isn't in the stores a week before Thanksgiving, y okay. you're not getting in. So. I think there could be a bit of a toy shortage this year. Shop early, you know, is yeah. my best advice to, uh, to the <laughs> parents out there. But I, it actually could be a problem. It could be yeah. a real problem. So I, people who are making toys should hurry up and make them here. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> what's on the left of the toy them. district here is going to be a very interesting place. Yeah. It's probably it's worth having someone come in and talk yeah. about it. But yeah. it, the, the lead paint in China, it is an article in today's business section of the Times that talks about, hey, you know, it was done for one reason, cheaper. Yeah. Lead paint yeah, is a lot cheaper, and that's why they course, did it. Of course, that's right. And no, and no right. standards, no regulations, right. nothing. So yeah, well, you think we have a Food and Drug Administration in this country no. without a history? Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So you basically have uh, been connected to local New York City and New York State right. politics. Mostly. But your work in New York City is if you go to the city council and you bring in progressive labor legislation, you don't have any trouble passing it, do you? Well, yeah, I don't know if you have any <laughs> trouble. Uh, <laughs> I really, you know, this notion that we kind of walk down a city hall, knock on the door, and they <laughs> ask us what we want, it's really not trick not or treat. Not during the Giuliani it, years. <laughs> it, it, it's, not, it's not trick or treat. Right. Um, actually, I think that right now, the, the council has, you know, grown up. Uh, uh -huh. It's matured under the new city charter. Uh, it's more of a, a debate and a dialogue on almost every issue that goes on down there. But, look, there's no doubt that when we go to city hall, we get a fair hearing. That doesn't mean we get everything we want, mm. but we do get the respect both from the mayor and from the speaker of the council uh, on our issues. And in that sense, you know, yeah, that's why we're organized. Yeah. We're organized because it increases the power, and that's why workers pay money to unions to try to help them on the public policy side. You know, we look at it this way. A, a, a rising cost of transportation or a rising cost of housing is a wage cut. Mm -hmm. So we do public policy to defend what we have won at the bargaining table. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Um, that's why we're there. 
I'm unapologetic about that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we should apologize. There are lobbyists in this country who believe 16-year-olds should be allowed to have M16s. I should apologize <laughs> for advocating for affordable housing. I don't think I'm not asking you to no, apologize. No, I'm not, I think it's no, really I'm just saying great. in general. Is the is the <laughs> Um, is Roger Tucson, is that, the, is the TWU part of your Yes, they're council? part of our council. So what happened when they went out on strike? Did you support well, them? Well, yes, we did. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, they came up against the Taylor Law, which is a law that outlaws uh, public sector workers from striking. We're trying now to work on seeing if we can get some kind of Taylor Law reform because there is no That's compulsion on the part of the law towards the employer to make him bargain fairly. Right. So and the employer can say, no, no, no. They did not bargain they, in I, good faith at I all. Felt to, I, I felt that also. that was really disgraceful. Right. I, I mean, they probably have uh, something to say about that. But yeah. it, it happens to workers all across the state, yeah. by the way. It's not unique yeah. to the transport It's interesting, because I think Bloomberg's done a good job. But he, when it comes to something like that, he doesn't understand, I don't think. Well, either he, he doesn't understand really, or he, he has very strong opinions. He didn't have a very good comment about them. Well, look, it, 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 I would tend to agree with you. In general, he's a good mayor. Yeah. We have our issues with him. I, the one thing he did that I really found distasteful was calling striking workers thugs. Yes, I mean these are really people terrible. that get out of bed every right. morning. They play the game. They go to work. They do right by their kids, and you don't call them thugs. I don't think he'd do it again, do you? I don't think he would do no. it again. Right. Uh, I, he got some pushback. So. so we have about a minute left. What you, did you think Giuliani was a good mayor? Uh, no, <laughs> um, I, and I thought he was a good manager. But I did not think he was a good mayor because he managed this city at the expense of the spirit of the city. He was too divisive. Yeah. Uh, this, this mayor has been a unifier in a lot yeah. of ways. It's very interesting. Is yeah. uh, union union people are generally happy with him, right? Um, well, you know, we have we all have contracts pending, right? All right. <laughs> we have issues at times, yeah. but in general, I would think that uh, some one labor leader said to me he thought it was the best mayor that he's seen in his life. That's very interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you very much. This has been a very interesting half hour, fun. and yeah, I've enjoyed quickly. talking to you, and I've learned a lot, and I'm glad that you came. Good to see you. Thank again. you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.